Well, hi there. We're looking at Jesus' parables. Today we start with the second category of parables, but more about that in a few minutes. My name is Peter de Villiers, and I'm with Villiersdorp Community Church in South Africa. I'm going to pray, and then I'll read from Luke chapter 15. But before I read, let me pray. Father God, we come wanting to learn and wanting to grow, but above all wanting to know you better. And that is what we pray for as we open your word today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke 15, from verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light up a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me! I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. 
But when the son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So last week we came to the end of parables that fall under the first category of parables, namely parables of God's kingdom. Today we start the second category, namely salvation parables. Now we've just read three parables, all dealing with something or someone that was lost. So I've mentioned that with each parable we have to look for the main point that the parable makes. But the problem, however, is that any parable or illustration only goes some way toward illustrating a real-life truth. Some parables, read in isolation from others, can drive home only half a truth. And a half-truth, seen as the full truth, can lead us totally in the wrong direction. I believe that this is why these three parables are grouped together. I'll get back to this later on. In these parables, we have the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. So who is Jesus telling these parables to? So in verse 1, we see that now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Now, if you read all the references to tax collectors in the New Testament, it is clear that tax collectors were probably one of the most despised groups of people of the day. And this was because they were often Jews who collected taxes for the despised Roman government. And often they would also take more money from the people and then what they paid over to the government coffers. And then the sinners, well, this refers to all those people that didn't comply with the rules and rituals of Judaism. So these two groups of people were the outcasts of society. They were the riffraff and criminals of the day. They were not part of the dignified, religious, good people of the day. But there's another grouping of people in this crowd listening to Jesus. We read in verse 2, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now this is the religious elite. I mean, they saw themselves as having an inside track to God. They despised Jesus. And from their highbrow position, they look down on Jesus. I mean, this, this wannabe teacher who is associated, even, um, associated with and even ate with sinners. So we have the outcasts eager to hear Jesus. And we have the elite eager to criticize Jesus, actually wanting to kill him. See, this was the thing with Jesus. He loved those that were despised, and he sought them out. I mean, what, what, the, what the religious elite saw as a reason to despise Jesus was actually a showcase of his glory. The, the unimaginable was true, that, that Jesus would stoop as low as necessary to save sinners. These three parables showcase this love of God. In these parables, we have owners and a father losing something or someone and then finding what was lost. So as a first point, I have valuing the valueless. Now, in the parable of the lost sheep, we may argue that this was perhaps not wise. I mean, we could ask now, who leaves 99 sheep to go after one? when leaving the 99 leaves them vulnerable to the threat of a predator. And the owner of the coin could also have said, but I still have nine other valuable coins. I'm not going to worry about only one that's lost. 
And the same with the father. I mean, he could have said that uh, the son that left home is getting his just reward. I'll focus on the son I still have, especially because he's the obedient and hard-working son. But that's not what happens here. In all three of these cases, that which was lost, even though it had far less value than that which was not lost, he searched for and longed for. Now to summarize, despite having 99 other sheep, the shepherd leaves his 99 sheep to look for the one that was lost because he valued that one lost sheep. And despite having nine other coins, the woman searched in every nook and cranny for the one lost coin because she valued that, that lost coin. And Despite having an obedient and faithful son, we can call him the good son, the father continued longing for, for what we can call the bad son, hoping that he would return. Why? Because he valued and loved this lost son. But when that which was lost is found and returns, what does that return look like. So we have the return. Now here we need to see two things. Firstly, we see that returning to God never takes place without repentance and conversion. And this, of course, is seen clearly in the parable of the lost son. But what about the other two? And the sheep, when found, can't come to repentance. And the coin can't come to repentance. So Maybe repentance and conversion are not that important when returning to God? Well, no. Look at what Jesus says when giving an application after these two first parables. See, just after sharing the parable of the lost sheep, in verse 7, Jesus says, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And what does Jesus say just after sharing the parable of the lost coin? Verse 10, In the same way, I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now we mustn't miss how important it is that, that turning to or returning to God always takes place with, with conversion and repentance. Now let me get to the second characteristic of returning to God. Do you remember that right at the beginning I said that reading some parables in isolation from others can give us half a truth, which can take us in the wrong direction? There is a possible problem when reading the parable of the lost son in isolation from the other two. See, it is possible that this parable can leave one with the impression that the father is in a helpless position when it comes to the return of his lost son. In other words, that implies that God is in a helpless position when it comes to the salvation of lost people like us. The son turned his back on his father and brother and misspent his inheritance on wild living. In the parable, there's no indication that the father does anything. He longs for his son's return and he looks out for his return, but he doesn't go looking for him. This implies that the son or the sinner then is fully in control in deciding to return home or not. The sinner is fully in control in deciding whether to return to God or not. Now, if this is the impression we have from this parable, we will not be seeing the whole picture. See, in the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin, the emphasis is on God actively searching for lost sinners. But in the parable of the lost son, the emphasis is on conversion and repentance. 
it is clearly possible, uh, impossible for the sheep and the coin to be found without God's intervention or God's active searching role. But I want to point out that even though the parable of the lost son emphasizes the, the deliberate and decisive returning of the son to his father, the parable also clearly shows us that, that this could not have taken place without God's intervention. You see, in verse 32, the father tells the other son, but we have to celebrate and be glad. Why? Because this brother of yours was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and he's found. Now Paul explains this to us in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. You see, dead people don't turn. And the point is that any sinner who comes to his or her senses and and turns or returns to God, does so because God searched for that person and resurrected that person who was dead to God into being alive to God. And there's one person in this parable of the lost son that we haven't looked at. And that other person is the other son. Now, this other son was the perfect example of a good son. In fact, when, he, when this wayward son returned, this good son was out in the field working, or to use his own word, he was slaving for his father. And as he came closer to the house, he heard the sounds of a celebration in full swing. There was food and there was music and dancing, all because the wayward son was back safe and sound. The father had even clothed him in the best robe and gave him sandals for his feet. This was too much for this older brother. See, the, the unquestioningly obedient, hard-working, prim and proper son he responded as he prob probably never previously responded toward his father. He was in a rage and he refused to be part of this celebration for a son that was totally his opposite. I mean, no longer did he even acknowledge the wayward son as his brother. He referred to him as that son of yours. If anyone deserved a party, it was him, not this wayward, deservedly destitute younger brother. In this parable, who does this, young, uh, this older brother represent? Now, in the original crowd around Jesus, he represented the Pharisees. Now, in Luke 18 verse 9, when introducing another parable, Luke describes the Pharisees as people who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else. But we have to see that this could be pointing back at us. You see, if we were to consider ourselves better than others, or more deserving of God's grace, or if we were to see ourselves as God's children because because of not being as bad as such and such a person, then we are the older brother. Then, like the older brother, we may even go as far as not wanting God to save those that, that today are seen as the outcasts of society, the, the down and outs, the destitute, that, that are destitute because of their own wrong choices. If we like the Pharisees, look down on those that are deservedly destitute. 
we may also get angry when God's grace and blessings are offered to them. We need to tread very carefully here. See, it isn't a given that the older good brother doesn't represent us. Now let me come to an application. Of course, with these lost items and the lost son, Jesus is pointing to us and is, is indicating just how miserable our condition is apart from God. And in each parable, the lost object remained extremely valuable to the owner. I mean, we can still understand that a sheep is valuable. I mean, the meat is expensive. And we can understand that money is valuable. But a son that has wasted his father's money on debauchery and wild living, well, that's another matter. And surely a son like that deserves to be living on the street. But not so in this parable. This father pined after his wayward son and longed for his return. And because of our rebellion against God, we are all lost. Remember, this is being addressed to the tax collectors and sinners, the outcasts of society. That's who we are without God. To use the language of the parable of the lost sheep, let me refer to Isaiah. I mean, Isaiah compares sinners to lost sheep. He writes in Isaiah 53 verse 6, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And Isaiah then goes on to show that, that despite our rejection of him, God continues searching for the lost and longing for the lost to return to him. It was for the sake of us as lost sheep that Jesus was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Jesus came to search for and find the lost sheep and, and lead them, that's us, into a restored relationship with God. In the parable of the lost sheep, Jesus is represented by the shepherd. Jesus said of himself in John 10 verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus also said in Luke 19 verse 10, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Now acknowledging ourselves to be lost, to be in need of a saviour, to be sinners in need of salvation doesn't happen easily. But this is something we can't get around. Romans 3 verse 23 says, um, and describes us as follows, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now in the lost son's conversion and return, we see three steps. Firstly, there's what is called in verse 17, coming to his senses. And we saw this as a coming from death to life, as it were, in, in the realization of his need for salvation. It is a realization of one's true condition before God, a condition of being lost. And the second step in his conversion was an honest confession of his sin. He said to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And then the third step was his physical return to his father. He confessed his sin, not only against his father, but against heaven. In other words, against God. The thing is that the mere realization of sin isn't enough. He had to go to his father and confess. And the father, like God, immediately organized the celebratory party. Verse 24. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. See, despite our sin and rebellion against God, despite 
each one of our tre- checkered, checkered pasts, God loves us. He loves us so that he anxiously makes every effort to find us. And he does this for our own good and because we are valuable to him. Verse 7, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Isaiah 55 verse 7 Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God for he will freely pardon. If you haven't come to true conversion and repentance, you can send me an email. Email address is below. Or speak to someone whom you know as a Bible-believing Christian. Don't let it be. Let me pray. Father God, we often come to you in prayer for many reasons and with many requests and desires and dreams. Today, we come to you as beggars, as sinners in need of forgiveness. We come to you as people totally dependent on you for salvation. Help us to remember to come to you in this way very often. Like the oldest son, We do not deserve to be called children of the Most High God. We ask your forgiveness for our waywardness. We ask this with gratitude and with boldness because of Jesus, your Son, who gave his life for this. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us uh, for this service. God willing, I'll be back next week for the next parables. As a song for today, I've got a song that I have used previously, but I just thought it fits in so well with today's message. It is the song by Crowder called God Really Loves Us. Until next time, God bless and goodbye.